Right, um, my name is George Lang. Uh, I work for Disability History Scotland. We are um, the only, as far as we know, um, organisation in Scotland that is uh, run and managed by Disabled Kidong, looking at Disabled Kidong's history. Um, other organisations obviously uh, have an, uh, an interest in history, but they are primarily uh, either uh, academic or they are other um, charitable organisations that aren't necessarily um, managed by disabled people themselves. So researching um, the difficulty has been in reclaiming our own history. Um, if we think about uh, another example, the example of perhaps black history or um, a feminist history, um, what they have found when they started was that um, they had to reclaim their history. Uh, we are exactly the same, we have to reclaim our history. And why we talk about reclaiming isn't that uh, other people have uh, taken it from us, it just hasn't been recorded as our history. So instead of there being a, a narrative um, about people, just general people, we have had to say, well, no, some of those people had uh, disabilities and that meant that they had their own stories. Or that their stories were enhanced or different from the stories that other people uh, would have who took part in exactly the same thing. So, for example, it would be uh, a different set of circumstances that would lead um, someone uh, coming back from the First World War, um, back into civilian life, having had a life-changing disability, to someone coming back who, apart from the, the, the possible memories and the, the possible uh, mental health issues, had no physical uh, life-changing issues. They would have participated in the same thing and been through many of the same experiences but the difference would have been in how they um, interpreted and how they then uh, were left to make sense of what happened to them. So that's why we talk about reclaiming. We also talk about reclaiming um, because in Britain, <coughs> yeah, in Britain, um, and in Scotland in particular, disability history hasn't actually been a thing. There have been um, people researching disability history, but from a medical point of view. So we'll have lots of history about um, surgery and the different techniques and how they were developed and who developed them and why they developed them and how the, the technique that was developed is better than the old technique. But we won't have anything about the patient or what difference it would make to the patient. It's important to, to talk about um, the, the UK because in America it's a completely different story. In America there's a massive, one would say, industry uh, in disability history. The only problem is that it's an academic uh, industry. So there are many universities uh, in America who have departments well resourced, well funded uh, and well staffed departments who do nothing but research history and not just medical history but social history as well. The problem with that is it's from an academic point of view. 
So they're not again interested in the individuals. They're more interested in the sociological impact. They're more interested in policy. They're more interested in the thing itself rather than the individual and how the individual um, lives and works and copes with you know, the disability. So we identified that there is a middle road and the middle road was about um, what we as people and tenants tell to ourselves and um, primarily about ourselves as individuals that that individual story has to come from somewhere and um, of course that individual story comes from you know, our own past that our past also coincides and overlaps with many thousands of other people's history for those who went to uh, segregated schools, uh, they can think of all the, the, the different classmates that we had, uh, for those who have spent years and years inside and outside different medical institutions, you know, we can think of people who've met, the stories of exchanged. There's a common history there, there's a common set of uh, perceptions and understandings. So it's making sense of what those commonalities are and to then try and influence what we tell ourselves about our own history and how our history fits into the wider narrative. And finally, what we identified is, um, and, and this goes back to the very foundation of disability history, we wanted to find a way to engage people in, at that time, uh, welfare reform. Um, welfare reform was uh, the forerunner to austerity. Uh, one would say it's all the same thing, and I certainly wouldn't disagree with that, that the label has changed. And that's kind of important when you know what you're, you're addressing, you need to remember what the label is. So welfare reform, as introduced by the Cameron government um, in uh, 2010, uh, 11, 12, um, was going to hugely disadvantage to those impairments, as indeed um, from here in 2017, we can look back and see that it has. So, so back in 2010, we saw this coming. We wondered whether this would be the catalyst to um, what had been in Scotland at least a muted, uh, if not um, an escalated, um, disability movement actually becoming vocal and active. And we saw no trust yet to that. We, we, the idea of um, hundreds of thousands of people with disabilities on the streets, we thought was unlikely. And we thought it was unlikely for many different reasons. But one of the, the primary reasons was that um, people in Scotland just didn't have the tradition of uh, opposition. Um, and again, there is many reasons for that, and that's not important for this story, but what we wanted to do was to find a way to reach those who, for whatever reason, didn't feel um, that the changes were either going to affect them or we're going to be as bad as, as we feared. The vehicle of the straight out political activism didn't work. It wasn't working, it hadn't worked for, you know, 20, 30 years. So there was no point in us forming any kind of political 
uh, overtly political uh, movement. But there was a point, we thought, in remaining to deliver some very basic truths, and that, uh, and those are that you have to look at history to find out where it's come from and to see the trends that we see again today. What we thought of back then as welfare reform and today as austerity are not new. They're, they're, repeti they're repetitions of history. And we can look back and we can point to these repetitions. We can point to similar language. We can point to similar acts of parliament. We can point to the similar way that the media has been used to influence social uh, attitudes. We can point to all these, not just once or twice, but several times in the last 100 to 200 years. So when we were talking about history, it wasn't to say this is all in the past. It was to say this has happened in the past and it looks very much like it's happening again. And we can either do what we did in the past, which is let it happen, or we can raise our voices and become involved. And for Disability History Scotland, we were not saying become involved in oppositional politics or become involved in politics at all. Our message was clear, with, our message was only that we needed to become active, not activists, but active. In other words, stop being passive. So, whether you wanted to go the whole hog and join the political organisation, or if you just wanted to chat to friends and neighbours and write letters to you know, the press, phone, radio stations, whatever it is you wanted to do, absolutely fine with us. We just wanted to go to take part. We just wanted to go to participate and feel that they had a choice. And that's what, um, for us, reclaiming history is about and for. For us, when we were talking about um, history, um, we were uh, conscious that th there are differences in um, what we would call the, the individual experience and the grand narrative of what um, the country uh, would experience. So an example of that would be um, looking at the health service um, and how the health service developed after the Second World War. It was, uh, if not one size fits all service, it is hugely predicated on the idea that everybody could access it, that everyone would be able to um, afford it, and that it would be there for no matter you know, what the, the income level and educational level and where about in society you are or where about geographically you are. And that all happened, that worked, that was excellent. When you come down however to the individual level um, there is all kinds of different issues. For example, um, Hostels, <laughs> as strange as it may sound, were not particularly accessible. Um, when you were looking at uh, ongoing regular uh, treatment, they would be um, at uh, different locations, sometimes quite far away from where you lived. So therefore, you know, the, the life of someone with uh, um, an impairment. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. But I thought someone who um, had an impairment 
to be completely stoned up with medical uh, issues. Uh, to spend quite a lot of time um, in a good hospital, recovering from treatment, getting more treatment. And really that was how the growth and tenants were seen. They were seen as uh, these medical uh, cases. Um, and what didn't tend to happen, and has only recently happened, is to see them as individuals. The, the contradiction there is that for the last at least 10 years, we've had a big push on um, the, the organisations like the Health Service talking uh, with the language of inclusion. And that means that they are person-centred, they're patient-centred, they uh, look at the needs of the individual. But yet, that is still uh, now, uh, it sounds as if I'm making some improvements, but the way things have developed is with the lack of money, the lack of staff, um, systems are developed where the more you are at odds with the rest of society, the more likely it is that you will be re-identified as the problem. So therefore, um, if you are on the autistic spectrum, for example, um, you're expected to uh, use the same services as everyone else. Now, in some ways, that's the ideal. But when that system can't cope with you as the individual um, not being able to um, being a, a, an environment that is noisy, full of light, uh, people moving around, then it's really difficult for you to access that. And we see this contradiction of ideas and contradiction of um, development um, throughout history. One of the really interesting pieces of uh, research that we, were, we looked at was how England and Scotland developed um, in terms of um, people being treated with mental health issues. Back in the uh, 1800s, um, Scotland became quite a, a, a popular destination uh, for people with mental health issues. Um, in fact, many uh, English families would deliberately choose to send uh, their relatives to Scotland. Uh, the east of Scotland, around about Dunbar, North Berwick, that was a hot spot uh, for a um, small scale uh, house institutions, as in, you know, based in a house rather than a hospital. Um, and uh, also the, the north of North East of Scotland. That was a, another hot spot. Um, and that was because Scotland had a different attitude. Um, and the attitude is really coming back to this idea of a house, of a community approach. We talk today about a community approach, about independent living and about how the uh, ideal, ideal is for both impairments and uh, learning disability and mental health. Um, to live in the community and be part of the community. Well, back in the 1800s, that was the model that Scotland had. The model in England was much more about a large hospital stroke prison type uh, buildings where um, it was much less dignified uh, and, and people could be lost within uh, you know, huge deadline type units. Um, and this difference in, in approach uh, was one that persisted in Scotland for quite some time. And only really changed once uh, the uh, unification of the English system and the Scottish system began to happen. 
and the colonies of scale as well as changes in attitude meant that Scotland started to follow the, the same pattern as England and to build hospitals uh, in, if not isolated units, certainly uh, separated units, not within um, your communities themselves. And just like um, the, the idea of the, uh, the, the grand narrative of the health service, we've got a change happening today where although we've had this period of uh, community um, living and independent living being um, encouraged uh, and to some extent um, brought upon us by the closure of many of the large institutions, we've now got the rise right here, right now, again of the larger institutions because of the news uh, towards limiting our budgets and um, the, the idea that the house um, five, six, seven, eight individuals in a communal uh, setting is cheaper for a local is cheaper for a local authority than it would be to offer each of those five, six, seven, eight individuals their own care package. So are we in fact going to go further back and start to see the re uh, establishment of large units which may or may not be called hospitals? that will certainly function in the same way as hospitals did back in the uh, 1800s all the way through to the 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, the, one thing that might um, reassert itself, however, is the difference between a Scottish uh, system and an English system. Uh, and that'll that the possibility of that exists because the, the reinvention of the Scottish Parliament and the way that uh, the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government has been uh, looking again at reinterpreting what um, we feel, Scotland feels, is uh, an inclusive uh, and equitable way of uh, dealing with people uh, and the issues of inclusion. It may be that with the um, distinct approach that's being offered by the Scottish Government to welfare um, payments, that that could be seen again in terms of how um, local authorities and other agencies are directed to deal with the issue of uh, independent living. This is all, and this all comes um, not as a surprise because we have the history to look back on and in some cases use the history to influence the decision makers today to say what did and what didn't work and why we, there are ideas that this shouldn't be reinvented because they were of a period and that period has now gone. Disability History Scotland um, sees history as having uh, a purpose. A purpose not necessarily for the individual or the community of people with impairments, but as a way to identify how we can lay out some strategies uh, to take forward the um, to lay out some strategies to combat the forces of, of oppression, the ideas that uh, keep people with impairments. Um, in their uh, second class position status um, and we see those solutions, we see those answers coming from history 
when history tells us about people acting together. Not in groups, but in large groups. So therefore all the different groups in Scotland who are disabled, disabled persons organisations, all those groups who say that they speak for disabled people, all those groups who are only made up of disabled people, all acting, not necessarily in agreement, but coming together to listen and to talk and to identify some very basic uh, to identify some basic understandings of what we would like to see. This is not to say that we form any kind of union or collective. It's not to say that we have to agree with each other. But what we have is years and years millennia, in fact, of evidence to show that unless we come together and have some common understanding, some common bond, some common language, nothing will change that improves the individual experience or the collective experience. There are small gains that are made but those small gains are so easily uh, slipped away, as you can see from uh, the last International Year of Disabled People in 1980. Um, there are lots of organisations started, there are lots of initiatives undertaken, there is lots of money put in. Out of all that work, all that energy, all that money, hardly anything exists today of uh, that legacy. Uh, what we have is a, a fractured and a disparate um, community of groups within Scotland who uh, are, are following for them their important work, their important agenda that are not coming together in order to follow an agenda that promotes inclusiveness for us all. We would only point to what happens south of the border, particularly in terms of culture, um, where the term disability culture in England is much more advanced, much more well understood and much more well celebrated than it ever is here in Scotland. How can uh, disabled people in Scotland Disabled people in Aberdeen, disabled people in Edinburgh share any commonality if we don't have at least some shared culture to think about, to express, to talk about.